the Virginia Horse Industry Board, and the Virginia Christmas Tree Growers Association are proud sponsors of Virginia Farming. This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Large or small, Virginia farmers work year-round to help put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Virginia Farming. I'm Amy Rocher. Today we travel to Hanover County and visit Wings of Hope Ranch, where rescued horses have been turned into therapy animals. Then Mark Viette shares tips on picking the right house plant. We'll also have the Ag Calendar and a Minute in the Field video. All this plus the Ag News of the Week on this edition of Virginia Farming. Twenty Paces will open a new farmstead, goat and sheep's milk, cheese production and processing facility in Albemarle County. The company will invest $321,000 to renovate and expand its creamery and create seven new jobs. Twenty Paces will produce high quality sheep and goat's milk and cheeses, as well as produce grass fed lamb and goat meat for restaurants and specialty food retailers in the Commonwealth and along the East Coast. The company also wants to ensure the transfer of farming expertise between generations through an apprenticeship program dedicated to sharing dairy farming knowledge with the community. 20 Paces will use 100% Virginia grown sheep and goat's milk for its products. Well, more ag excitement in Albemarle County where Kelly Turkeys USA will build a poultry production and processing facility. The company, which sells high-end heritage breed turkeys through the direct and retail markets, will invest $1.4 million in the new facility, creating more than 30 new jobs, and will increase production to 10,000 turkeys a year by 2018. Kelly Turkeys USA is a division of a poultry company that was founded in the United Kingdom in the 1970s. Kelly Turkeys has grown steadily in sales and reputation over the past few decades and has been voted the best turkey in the UK for eight consecutive years. Well, farmers market season has kicked off at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The USDA's Bob Ellison has more. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack cut the ribbon to open the 20th annual USDA Farmers Market, which brings rural farm products to urban Washington. It's an opportunity for small and mid-sized producers to have a market that they can control, uh, where they have a relationship with their customer and they can determine an appropriate price for whatever they produce. We want more and more young folks to be participating in agriculture and we're excited about the opportunities that farmers markets as a market opportunity for those beginning farmers and ranchers and producers creates. This market connects us to all the farmers coming from nearby Virginia or Delaware or Maryland and supplying us with their fantastic wares, fresh, healthy, affordable food. I love to eat fresh locally grown produce. To me it tastes better than what I can get at the store. And for area farmers, it's a chance to maintain healthy finances. Our business plan for us to do well as a farmer, we need to bring our product to larger urban areas. Farmers markets represents 20% of our gross revenue, so it's an important 20% where we get a full retail price. To find a farmers market near you, go to www.usdalocalfooddirectories.com. In Washington, for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, I'm Bob Ellison. Thanks, Bob. A new report shows tremendous demand for recent college graduates with a degree in agricultural programs. The report shows an estimated 57,900 high-skilled job openings annually in the food, agriculture, renewable natural resources, and environment fields in the United States. According to an Employment Outlook report released by the USDA's National Institute of Food and Agriculture and Purdue University, there is an average of 35,400 new U.S. graduates with a bachelor's degree or higher in agriculture-related fields. That's 22,500 short of the jobs available annually. Now, Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack said those receiving degrees in agricultural fields can expect to have ample career opportunities. 
Not only will those who study agriculture be likely to get well-paying jobs upon graduation, they will also have the satisfaction of working in a field that addresses some of the world's most pressing challenges. And these jobs will only become more important as we continue to develop solutions to feed more than 9 billion people by the year 2050. Well, horses are known to be therapeutic. Today we visit Wings of Hope Ranch just outside of Richmond to find out how they're taking in rescue horses and turning them into therapy animals. That's straight ahead on Ag Insights. Today we're in Montpelier, Virginia in Hanover County at Wings of Hope Ranch and I'm joined by Martha McClurkin, the president of Wings of Hope Ranch. Martha, thanks for having us out today. You're quite welcome. So, Tell us, what is Wings of Hope Ranch? What do you guys do? Wings of Hope Ranch has a mission of bringing kids who have struggles and challenges to allow the horses to minister to them. And our horses are rescue horses. And um, so we allow the horses who have been rescued to kind of rescue the kids from their, the circumstances that they have in their lives, which usually aren't very pretty. So you mentioned that your horses are rescue horses. How do you get them? Um, at the present time, we go through uh, rescue organizations and find horses through them, and we adopt them through rescue organizations. We haven't always done that. We have taken in some horses straight from a field where they've been rescued from. We have a little pony, a Blossom, who was taken that way, who we adopted right from the rescue field, and uh, Cinnamon also. With We fostered a horse for USERL, which is US Equine Rescue League, and we have used them on many occasions to try horses out for our program. So that's how we get horses today. So do you get contacted by animal control or exactly how do the horses come to you? We don't get calls directly from animal rescue organizations or the game wardens, as you mentioned. Um, we do uh, receive phone calls, however, from the public um, who, can no, who are in circumstances where they can no longer take care of their horse for whatever reasons, health, uh, financial. There's a lot of horses that need a home and even a lot of the rescue facilities today are bursting at the seams waiting for horses to be placed before they can take in other horses. So we don't get calls directly from them but uh, we work with the organizations that do get phone calls from them. What does it take to get a rescue horse ready for therapy? Uh, that's the million dollar question. Every horse has a unique personality, and obviously safety is our number one uh, concern here. We want the, the horses to be child safe because they are working with children. And um, some horses require more work than others. Some come to us with a very pleasurable uh, mis uh, demeanor, and other times uh, it takes longer. Um, it does take time in the saddle. We have to ride the horses a lot um, in order to get them prepared uh, to be safe for the children. Some of the horses and what we really look for are horses that come to us that have already been gentled um, and who are under saddle already and may have been in a rescue situation because um, they may not have been ridden, they can't be ridden very much. They have an injury that keeps them from being able to do the job that their owner wanted them to do. Um, most of our horses come to us from pretty desperate situations. And so it does, that's why we go th a lot of times now go through the rescue organizations. They can do a lot of the gentling on the front end. So when they come here, they, there is more work to be done. Uh, but it's more getting used to their environment. And from time to time, horses don't like this job. Uh, they're not used to being led around by a leader um, with a child on them. So um, we do, it, 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 it varies because each horse is different. So who are the children that come to Wings of Hope? We have a vast array of children that come here to the ranch. They struggle with anything from uh, ADHD uh, to uh, severe spectrum autism, 
uh, Asperger's syndrome. We have some with uh, fairly severe psychological challenges um, where they struggle with being happy, being alive. And uh, we, have, uh, we have some relationships with different organizations. One is a safe house that takes in young women who've, who were taken from their home because they were abused. Um, and everything, we really do not say no to a child. Uh, many of them have depression. Uh, so it really varies. There's no real uh, consistency on what a child is going through. So our goal is, is to see as many children as we can in a season and, uh, and help bring hope to them. Um, some of them don't have a, much hope outside of being here. This is the one place they feel like they can come where they're safe, where they can have fun, where it's peaceful and quiet. So when the ranchers come, do they pick out a horse? Does the horse pick them? Or do you kind of match the, the rancher with the horse? That's a good question. Um, what, because we know our horses very well, um, and we learn more about the children through the application process, we will actually do the matching ahead of time before they come to the ranch. That way we can ensure the safety of that child and we know the personality of each horse and it, we can better be able to match them up with the right horse that's gonna meet them where they are in both their understanding of horses and um, their fear or no fear of horses. So how do you cycle the visits? Do the kids come once a week, once a month? How does that work? We have a seasonal program and um, the kids will come once a week during that season. So every season, new kids have an opportunity to join. Um, but we like our program to be that level of consistency. Um, the child is paired with one horse and one leader for, that, for their time during that season. So every week they get to see the same face of a leader, maybe a youth leader paired in there depending upon the child's needs and the same horse so that bonding can occur. And it is, having worked with children now myself for seven years, there are real strong attachments that you get with that child. There's, so the child's not only bonding with the horse, they're also bonding with their leader and uh, really are able to, to gain a sense of trust and really talk about the things that are important to them and just listen to them more than anything. So when the ranchers are here, what exactly do they do? The first thing that we do in the beginning is really get them used to being around horses, especially if they haven't had much horse experience. But every session includes uh, grooming the horse at first, and that's where a lot of the bonding can take place, is in that stall where they're, while they're grooming the horse, they can talk to the horse, and um, the horses love that grooming. And um, then after they're groomed and tacked, uh, we will go up to the ring and they'll get to ride the horse if they choose to ride. Most of the kids that come want to ride, but there's a few that would prefer not to ride. So we want the child to feel safe, comfortable, and have a great time. That's our number, number one rule is safety. Number two rule is have fun. So we don't force any child to ride, but most of them like to. Um, and then after we end, uh, we untack and we try to fit in a chore uh, so that, you know, keeping horses isn't uh, always, it's not an easy job. So uh, you can't just go somewhere and have somebody tack up and you go enjoy it. So we allow them to do a chore and then we have a devotional and uh, we have a wonderful lady who's done our devotionals uh, this year named Joyce and she prepares the lesson and usually some type of craft or coloring project that goes along with that. The ranchers come here for free. How do you keep this operation going? We are an all volunteer organization with the exception of one paid uh, trainer who comes and works with the horses. Um, volunteers are the life of, the, of, our, of our organization. And uh, we also 
exist off of donations. We have a couple of fundraisers each year. One of our largest fundraisers is the Hoedown for Hope, and that's every September. And uh, it's a great time of barbecue and live music. And uh, it's a really fun time where we get to show our horses off to the people who support our organization. So approximately, what does it cost to take care of one horse for a month? More than one would think. Uh, but for one horse, depending on the horse, it could be and how much grain they eat. We've got two Arabians that eat a lot, and they um, are about $150 a month. Um, then there's farriering, which is uh, an added $30 a month. So it quickly adds up to about $200 plus per horse per month. And how many horses do you keep here? Um, we have um, seven stalls, so we have seven horses. We're, we're a full house right now. Um, we would, it would be great if we could have more. The more horses we have, the more volunteers we have, the more children that we can see uh, each season. So how about introducing us to a couple of your horses? That would be great, Amy. Okay. Let's go take a look. Now, who is this? This is Sal. She's our newest horse to the ranch. She's been here about two weeks now. And Sal is a Tennessee walker. And she came to us through a, a friend who learned of our organization. And she had actually rescued Sal uh, from a man who uh, really mistreated her. So she has warmed up beautifully to the kids and to everyone here. So how does she act with the kids when the kids are here? Oh, you can see her temperaments already, just very, very sweet. And she loves the kids. And right now we're using her to groom because she's so new to the ranch. We allow several months of riding her and practicing, and practicing with her to make sure that she is going to be child ready. All right, so who else, who else do you have around that we can meet? Let's see, who else do we have over here? This is Faith, and Faith came to us through an organization in Maryland called Days In Horse Rescue, and uh, she's a Polish Arabian that was rescued in 2011 with 133 other horses from a breeding facility. And um, she was in such bad shape uh, that her organs had actually uh, started to shut down. So oh, she goodness. was very, very, very malnourished very, um, she was in bad shape. Um, we also have her sister named Hope, and Hope is a little bit younger. Uh, Faith here is uh, about 19 years old, and her sister is about 16 years old. Well, she is beautiful. Yes, she is. And she looks like she's doing very well. She looks very, very healthy. She is doing very well here. They really like being here with their six other friends. And uh, she's one of our favorite horses for many of our ranchers. Uh, she has a little bit more get up and go than one that, like a sow would. So, um, so she is very spunky and has a great time with the kids and they with her. Great. Right? Mm -hmm. Now I think we have another horse that one of our volunteers, Tracy, is going to bring over. We want to hear about her too. Blossom is a little rescue who um, we actually took straight from the rescue where she was rescued from, which was from tied behind somebody's trailer where she had been tied up like a puppy dog. But she had not had, she has not had, until she came here, she had not had much human interaction at all. And you can see she thinks a lot about herself. She is a very spirited little horse. She is. Um, and she is just adorable. But when we got her, her feet had not been trimmed in her life. Um, so she has had some problems with her hooves and uh, she is susceptible to foundering, which means uh, a, a lameness. So she is kept on out of the grass because that makes her feet sore. Okay, wow. Well, she is very sweet. She They're all. Is really one of the, she is the favorite, I think, of most ranchers, but because of her, um, her issues, she's not rideable, but uh, the kids love to groom her, and we have one little rancher named Samantha who loves to train her, and she sets up obstacles for her and lets her jump over them, and they have a good time, and she also fixes her hairdo up and braids her and, and all that, so the kids Aww. really, really have fun on the ground with her. Well, she's more their size. <laughs> she certainly is. Yes, she is. 
so I want to know if people want to get in contact with you or want to donate time or money to Wings of Hope Ranch, what's their best way to doing that, of doing that? Their best way to do that is by visiting our website, which is wingsofhoperanch.org. And we have tabs on there for donating and for volunteering. So you can find everything about us uh, that you haven't learned here on our website. Great. Thank you so much for having us out today. It's been a blast. You're quite welcome, Amy. Likewise. We'll be right back. House plants can really brighten up your surroundings, and you can grow some pretty exotic plants indoors. With tips, here's Mark Viette. Many of our house plants are what we call tropical plants. They're plants from different parts of the world that really may not freeze, or if, if they do freeze, they still get very warm at other times of the year. So these are plants that we want to bring indoors that may be growing in an area that has a lot of humidity. So I recommend a couple things. First of all, try to pick house plants that have been grown locally in a greenhouse for a couple weeks. Maybe they've been grown all year long. But when it comes to picking a house plant, there are certain types that you can pick that I call super hardy purple thumb. For example, when we go to our greenhouse, we might find a beautiful plant like this, alocasia, nice, beautiful, shiny leaves. But this plant needs a lot of light, but very high humidity. Very much like the peace lily right here in the front. This peace lily also needs a lot of humidity. On the other hand, you can pick a plant that is commonly known as the cast iron plant. That means it can withstand lots of environment. Low temperatures indoors, low light, dry conditions, wet conditions. So go for those easy to grow purple thumb plants like a cast iron plant. Or on the other hand, right here, we have Sansevieria. It's also known as mother-in-law's tongue. It stays with you forever. So if you want to pick one of those easy plants, you might consider Sansevieria. The other thing, when you're looking at trying to buy house plants, look at the foliage. This is a Norfolk Island pine. Beautiful, nice green, lime, yellow foliage. But sometimes when you look closely at this, or if you feel the foliage, it's brittle, it's gray, the leaves are drooping, even the needles start to droop, or if you hit it, all the needles fall off. So try to pick a good, healthy plant. But keep in mind, Norfolk Island pines like high humidity. So you might have to set up a humidifier in your house. Bright light, high humidity, easy way to grow Norfolk Island pines. There are some other long-lived plants that you can grow indoors. One of my favorite is commonly known as the ponytail palm. And we grow this in a tropical garden in St. Thomas. And this plant has got to be almost six feet wide, or at least the, the base of it is six feet wide. And it's a beautiful, easy to grow long-lived plant. Now, the only thing I will tell you on this plant, my cats love it. So it's really hard to grow this with any kind of foliage indoors in my house. Two other plants you could consider. One of them is Dracaena, which you commonly see. Just keep in mind, as it grows, it's common for them to lose the lower leaves, so occasionally you have to cut them back, which related to this plant here, commonly known as the corn plant. When you're traveling and you're going to like business places or malls, and when you see plants growing in those environments, it's a sign that that plant is a really easy to grow plant. So consider this plant, and you can see wherever it was pruned, it sent out new shoots just like this. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time in the garden. Taking a look at the Ag Calendar, the WVPT Kids Book Festival will be held Saturday, May 30th from 11 to 2 at the Rockingham County Fairgrounds. There will be books, fun and games for all ages, and Virginia Farming will be there, so come out and try your hand at milking a cow. That does it for our show. Thanks so much for watching and have a great week. I'm Amy Rocher for Virginia Farming.
This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Large or small, Virginia farmers work year-round to help put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org.